And so uh, I'm going to start off, and where I'm going to start is a little bit of a definition of what is wearable resistance. And as the name suggests, it's resistance that we can affix to ourselves in some manner. And if you go into Google Images on the internet, you will see plenty of ideas uh, around how we can affix weight to ourselves. And there are some of some of the ideas that you see. The the guy in the top right hand corner there is my ori uh, original uh, foray into wearable resistance in the 1990s. That, I designed that little vest uh, and to be quite off, honest with you, it was a shocker. It, we put weight, uh, fishing weights in the, the vest and any time you ran it bounced up and down and if you ran really fast it just about knocked you out. So. Thank God Joe has come along and designed something that's a little bit more safer and uh, a little bit more uh, streamlined in that the athletes don't mind wearing it. And in most cases, you don't even know that it's on. This next video clip will give you a sort of a little bit of insight into the, the wearable resistance that we're used to uh, playing with and doing the research over the last six years. So uh, it's from our TV1 news station about three or four years ago. They came out and did a little bit of a broadcast us on us uh, at AUT Sprints. Now hopefully Mario will start that video for us. Kiwi sprinter Joseph Miller has already proved he's fast. Now he's turned to some unique training aids in his quest to become the first New Zealander to break the 10 second barrier for the 100 metres, even putting a modern day twist on some medieval technology. Joseph Miller has started wearing a suit to work, but this is far from your average business suit. It can look very medieval at times, I'm walking around with some armour on. It's called Exogen, and Kiwi sports scientists are some of the first in the world to try it out. It gives a whole new meaning to the idea of bodyweight training. Each of these panels weighs 200 grams. It's made up of small bits of metal, so it moves a bit like chain mail. It's got a Velcro back, meaning the athlete can place it on exactly whichever muscle they want to get the resistance. If you tried to you know, carry a dumbbell or a you know, barbell you know, whilst you know, doing this stuff, it, it wouldn't you know, work out you know, so well. Coach Dr Paul Gamble is using the suit to increase Miller's stride. He can already move his legs quickly, but if he learns to push further with every step, he'll cover distance faster. Having them as short so I can actually work on lifting my knees as well as you know, standing up tall and, and having all that going, it's um, just a really good transfer into exactly what I want it to be doing. Okay, so that gave a little bit of insight to the wearable resistance that we are used to using uh, at AUT Sprints in terms of the research that we're doing. It's uh, compression garments which to which we affix these little teardrop weights and these weights come in around about 50, 100, 200 and 300 grams loading which is around about 7, 14 and 21 ounces. So they're not, they're not heavy. So some of you will be saying, geez, that's not resistance training, lifting 7 ounces or 14 ounces. Uh, how can that be resistance training? So what I want to do is just give you some a, a little bit of a brief introduction into the physics behind wearable resistance so you understand why light weight can be uh, quite a good form of resistance training. Now the first thing that we've got to understand is that we are all interested, or a lot of us are interested in developing the strength or the force capability of our athletes. And so if we were uh, performing traditional resistance training, we would take a, uh, a focus on mass. We would actually put a lot of external load on a bar, uh, which is external forces, and then we'd ask the, the body to produce a lot of internal forces to overcome these external forces. Now, this you can see the formula for developing force is force equals mass times acceleration. For traditional resistance training, this is a mass focus. And as a, as a result of putting a large amount of mass on a bar, you cannot move it very fast. That is, the velocity will be small, as will the accelerations. So what we do with variable resistance is we actually flip the paradigm. We actually put some very, very light loads on, and as a result, as you can see in the 
the formula, the acceleration or the movement velocity and therefore the acceleration becomes the focus. So the masses are small, but the movement velocities are high. So we've got two different ways of developing force capability. One has a mass or load focus, one has a very uh, high velocity accelerative focus, okay? And I would suggest if you're trying to develop fast athletes, the latter most probably is a better model due to the pr principle of specificity. So that one, that's one set of formula you need to understand. We have two ways of developing force capability, one emphasizing mass, one emphasizing movement velocity and acceleration. The only other thing that I'd like you to really understand regarding the uh, wearable resistance, there's quite a bit of physics in it, but the next concept, I think, if you understand this concept, you'll understand why it works. And it's the concept of rotational inertia. Now, inertia is the resistance of a body or a limb or whatever to a change in motion. Okay, and that's a function of mass. So if I'm heavier, then a guy that is 80 kgs, say I'm 100 kgs, and this guy is 80 kgs, it takes more force to move the 100 kgs. And it's the same with a limb. If a limb weighs 10 kgs, it has X amount of inertia. If we put some extra load on the limb, it has extra inertia. It weighs more, so therefore it requires more force to accelerate and then decelerate, then re-accelerate. So that's the concept of inertia. The concept of rotational inertia is related to mass once more. Okay, so heavier limbs will require more force. So we could put wearable resistance on the limb, on the thigh here, and it's going to require more force to move it. But also we see this formula here, it's got an R squared in it. So it's not only a function of mass, it's a function of how far you're away from the axis of rotation. And in this example, the axis of rotation is the hip joint. So where you place the mass has a, a great influence on rotational inertia. So if we place the, the mass close to the axis of rotation, which is the hip joint here, that is called a proximal load. And that type of loading is not going to require a hell of a lot of force from the hip flexors and extensors. However, as we actually move the load down the thigh, we're getting further and further away from the axis of rotation. As a result, the R is increasing, and so therefore it gets squared. Until we can shift that load way down to the thigh, which we call distal loading. And that's around about 50 centimetres away from the axis of rotation or the hip joint. Now, it's the same load. It's 200 grams or 7 ounces. But where we put it has a great influence on the rotational forces, the actual forces that are required to accelerate, decelerate, and re-accelerate. And notice it's squared. Okay, the influence of moving it down the thigh is exponential. So 10 centimetres, if you shift it by 10 centimetres, it, it, it has an effect of 100. 10 times 10 is 100. So uh, the placement of these light loads is a, a method of overload that we actually uh, take into account when we're programming with wearable resistance. So. In sum, there's lots more physics behind it, but the concept that we want you to understand is move the loads quickly, because that's a different way of developing force capability, emphasizing acceleration rather than mass, and understand this concept of rotational inertia, as it's a means for you to actually progressively overload your athletes. Initially, you would start with loads very close to the axis of rotation, and as they give you feedback that they're handling the loading, then you would shift it down the thigh to become more distal. Question for you. You see A and B, which one has more rotational inertia? They're the same loads. This is 400 grams or 14 ounces on this thigh and 400 grams on this thigh. Exactly the same loads on this B but because it's further away from the axis of rotation, 
it's going to require more forces to get it going. So let's understand or calculate what the effect of moving these loads from mid femur, which is here, down to distal femur. So we've got, got some maths there for you. What I would like you to concentrate on is the 400 gram or the 14 ounce loading. Here, if we actually add 400 grams to each thigh, the increase in rotational inertia is around about 4.7%. So it's actually 4.7% harder to get the thigh going with the loading mid femur. So that's quite a substantial increase in work or F muscular effort for just shifting 400 grams down your thigh. Now let's look at the next example where we have a look at what we call distal loading. It's slipped as far away from the axis of rotation, the hip joint, as far as we can. So what do we see here? The same load slipped down the thigh, thigh further, we can see increases the rotational inertia by about 12, uh, 8% compared to mid femur. So it's 12% harder to get the thigh going, or it requires 12% more effort to accelerate, decelerate, and reaccelerate. So you can see that the, the placement of the wearable resistance or the teardrops has a large influence on muscular work and effort. So let's look at some of the applications and findings of the wearable resistance. Firstly, we've been building the evidence base over the last six years, and, and Joe needs to be commended on this. He wanted a product that had a lot of uh, research behind it. So we have done that. We've had uh, uh, quite a few postgrad students engaged in research, and also we've got a lot of research partners around the world conducting research for us in various sports and activities. The ones that I'm going to share with you today are the ones that are, are doing some re uh, sprint research with us. So we have Aaron in Arizona. We've got Chris here who's been doing work with us in Chicago. We've got Annabelle and Gustavo in uh, Argentina. We've got Neil Pizotis and Oliver in Swansea. Uh, we've had Nart, Nart and Helen in South Africa. And we've got Ryu and his lab in uh, Japan, and plus there's a lot of stuff happening in New Zealand. So I'd like to thank these people because that's what I'm going to draw on now in terms of the sprint research. We've had about 25 peer-reviewed publications in this, in this area, and we've got uh, about 12, 13 uh, publications in terms of trying to understand sprinting and how to make people quicker. So that's what I'm going to share with you over the next uh, 10, 15 minutes is some of this research, some of the more important findings that I think uh, that are, are worthy of mention. So the first, uh, uh, oh, coming back there, hopefully we can have a look at that video that's in, uh, in that little piece there. Now this, this is out of Ryu Nagahara's lab in Japan. Uh, a lot of sprint research takes place here. The play the video? Yes, please. Some reason, oh, there you go. Okay, so like I'll just talk through this. This this lab is pretty special, and if you have a look in, on the track here. doesn't matter. But the, uh, the, 
the track there had 50 force plates in a row. So a lot of the research that we've, uh, sprint research has been done on in-ground force plates. Here, here's the picture here again. Uh, so along here, you can actually see there's, there's these force plates, 54 force plates in a row. So the actually athletes are running over all these force plates in ground. So it's gold standard research in that we're trying to understand the sprinting in terms of overground forces. And we, you can also see that we've got all these mocap cameras down here. One of the most interesting findings here, thanks, uh, we can go back to the slide now. One of the most interesting findings here was that the when we put one to two percent body mass on the athletes and got them to run over the force plates we asked them how much harder was it and they said around about 20 to 25 percent harder but when we had a look at the force plate signals there was no difference or very small differences in the ground reaction forces and and, and powers and impulses etc like that and just just to make sense how can actually the athletes say it's 25 harder, but the, the changes that we're seeing in the force signals are around 1-2%. to we, we sort of had a, uh, a, a revelation in that, guess what, the force plates are measuring linear forces, vertical ground reactions, and anterior posterior or medial lateral ground reaction forces, they're all linear forces, but the overload that wearable resistance provides is rotational, and so therefore the linear linear uh, devices are not picking up the forces that the wearable resistance is providing. So that was pretty cool in that, you know, even though we're moving in a straight line, that motion is the product of rotation at the joints. And so therefore, we, we've, uh, we, we've got a, a new form of resistance training providing a direct rotational overload. So that was fairly unique. And as, as a result, we're doing a lot of research with inertial sensors now, trying to quantify, there's an inertial sensor affixed to the thigh there, trying to quantify the rotational overload that the wearable resistance is providing. So the first thing that we found, I guess, was the vest loading. We've done a lot of, a lot of research in the vest loading and it's more of a vertical overload. Whereas when we start loading the limbs, we have more of a rotational overload. And depending where we put the, the, the resistance, whether it be the thigh, we have an overload across the muscles at the hip. Whereas if we put calf loading on, we have overload across the knee and the hip. So we're in essence training the muscles, uh, when we shank load or calf load, we're training the muscles across the hip and across, across the knee. Okay, so it's a you get a double whammy with calf loading. And because it's so far away from the axis of rotation, a light weight down here is still a substantial, very much a substantial overload. In fact, one of the uh, studies that came out of Wales was if we put 600 grams here at the thigh, we can cut it by a third and put 200 grams here at the calf and we get the same rotational overload at the hips which was quite cool. So what have we been trying to do? Uh, believe me, it, the research has been in the making for six years and we can go for another six. And I'll let you know why, because what we did initially was have a look at the best compared to the thigh or uh, to, the lower, to the lower legs, okay? So it was best versus limb loading. After a little while, we found that the limb loading was of interest. So therefore we started looking at thigh loading versus calf loading and all the different permutations of that, you know, different percent body masses. Then what we've gone to now is we're trying to look at anterior versus posterior loading. So there's a, a, just a myriad of different ways you can load with the wearable resistance, which is interesting, but also challenging. Okay. so. Uh, and as I say, we'll be researching for a long time yet. But what I've tried to show in this diagram, even if we take, I love these deterministic models. Speed is the product of step length and step frequency. This is from James Hay many, many years ago, a great biomechanist. And these determinants tell us what makes up step length, what makes up step frequency, et cetera, et cetera. And so they always remind me of the things that we should be looking at 
uh, to change the speed of people, but also to see how different uh, training stimuli affect these different determinants of speed. So what I've tried to show in this slide here is anything with a black uh, arrow in it denotes the best loading. Uh, it's got a little green arrow. Yeah, there it is. So again, black arrow arrows mean best loading. Red arrows means limb loading. So we can see straight away from this that red decreases. When we limb load, we can see a decrease in step frequency. When we see the best loading, we can see a decrease in step length. And this has been found in quite a few studies. So going through all these bits and pieces, we have actually just put what we are seeing with the different types of loading. Okay. So, for example, we'll have a, a bit of a deep deep dive in the step step frequency, and it makes a little bit of sense. As soon as we put some weight on a limb, it actually slows the swing velocity down. And if it's slowing the swing velocity down, when it, the the leg hits the ground, it is actually on the the ground longer. And because the swing velocity is slower, the step frequency will be slower or less. So we know that limb loading is a step frequency overload. However, if we have a look at the step length when we use when we use this, well, the vest loading is more of a vertical overload. So what it affects, it, it affects the, the rise and fall of the center of mass. So you don't spring as high when you've got a vest on, which makes a lot of sense. As a result, your flight distance is less, your flying phase is less, and your support time is greater. So your step length is compromised with vest loading. So people will say, well, why would you actually load if they're going to be, you know, if these various loading patterns are going to actually decrease step length and step frequency? Well, these types of loading are methods of overloading the various determinants. So if you've got an athlete that you want to improve the step frequency, well, you would use limb loading. And hopefully over time, they would, you, know, you would actually train with limb loading. And when you took it off, their step frequency would improve. And conversely, the same with step length. Okay? So we've got lots of research happening in this area. Some of the the latest bits and pieces of research are finding that you know hip loading is hip and, and shank uh, cause exactly the same type of uh, increase in extension at toe off, but the hip loading decreases hip flexion only, the the, uh, the, the thigh loading. Okay, and so we have other uh, research also finding that. The shank loading is causing an increase in the braking phase, increase in braking impulse. So the momentum of the, the lower leg is most probably getting pushed out a little bit further in, in front of the line of center of mass and causing a bit more of a, uh, a, a little bit of a change in technique. But again, we don't worry too much about these small changes because by overloading the various aspects, we perhaps can come be become better at the, at the uh, various determinants of sprinting. I want to just share with you a couple of training studies so that you can see what we've been doing in this training area. This one is out of South Africa. This one is just with rugby players and we put 1% body mass on the calf sleeves. And what we did is we just uh, did uh, radar profiles of them. So from the radar profiles, we can get 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 meter splits and we can get measures of horizontal force and power. The training study was uh, over six to eight weeks, and it was the, the beautiful thing about wearable resistance. You can divide the groups up into a control which doesn't have the, uh, the wearable resistance on, and then you have the intervention group which does, and then they just use the wearable resistance as part of what they do. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays nights, these guys were doing sprint training. Half the group had wearable resistance, half the group didn't. Tuesday was an acceleration type training. Thursday was more max velocity training. Uh, there's a video here, and the video shows just the rugby players doing a, a, a sprint, but it, 
I always enjoy looking at this video because on the side here you can see rugby is just uh, built for all players. We've got small, we've got big, and, uh, and you can see some of the players here have got no wearables as we find some here. But the training was like just series of sprints, whether it was longer sprints, shorter sprints, etc. Like that. Now the 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 training study actually. Came, turned out to be a little bit of a shocker because the players did not attend and in the end they missed a lot of training sessions and we had attendance rates of around about 60%. So in, in the end, these... Uh, <laughs> get out of this video. In the end, we uh, wondered whether this training study would be of any value to us, but we found some really unique uh, findings in that these guys on average attended one training session a week. Now, if I go to bring you to this graph, over here we can see the control group. This is the group that didn't use any wearable resistance, and this is the wearable resistance group. So in terms of one training session a week, I'll just bring you to this one here. Here are the, the peak forces and the peak powers. Here is your pre-test and here is your post-test. You can see over the course of the training study, which is around about six weeks, there was a 14% decrease in force, peak force, and a 11% uh, decrease in peak power in the training group, I mean the control group. This is the group that did not use the wearable resistance. Whereas over here, the wearable resistance group, here are their pre-posts, and as you can see, there was very little loss in their peak force and peak power. If we look at the 5 metre and the 10 metre times also, remember they are only training once a week uh, because of poor attendance, because of exams and weather, etc. like that. This group here got slower by 7.87% and for their 10 metre time, 4.9% increase in sprint times. For the same training, they were doing exactly the same training, but they were using the shanks or the calf sleeves. The wearable resistance group had no change in sprint five meter times and a 0.49% uh, increase in the 10 meter time. Then if you actually look at were there significant differences between their groups? There certainly was. So what we found with this type of training, training once a week with wearable resistance actually maintained the peak force and the, the peak power and sprint times more so than training in an unloaded condition. Now this finding was particularly significant in that those teams that are time poor or those teams that have congested schedules, this might be a way of ensuring that you do not detrain in the season. Rather, you may be able to use wearable resistance and maintain all those pre-season uh, strength, power, speed gains. So in, in the end, it turned out to be quite a good research. Another uh, study that we did came out of uh, Argentina uh, with uh, Annabel Bustos and Gustavo Metro, Metro, which was a very interesting study because we've always maintained that if you can use wearable resistance in a warm-up, uh, if you have a well-structured warm-up, you might probably be able to uh, improve some of the athletic yeah, qualities yeah, of your athletes. Dale, 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 arranca, arranca, As you can see arranca, here, this is a, a, a very good soccer team, an under-70 yeah. soccer team that won the competition the, the previous year, and they were just using their, uh, the wearable resistance as part of their warm-up. And so they were doing lots of, they did a typical, you know, four to six minute warm-up where they just did stretches, and you can play the videos if you want uh, in the background. Uh, please, Mario. Uh, Typical warm up where they yeah, did yeah, just warmed up gradually and did some more active stretching. Then they went into the yeah. uh, sort of technical kicking type drills, which is the bottom video, uh, where they just kick and chase. But you can see they're still sprinting and running quite hard, but there's a little bit more ball in it. 
Then at the end, they did this, uh, the top video where you see them jump, accelerate, and they jump some more standing long jumps. Uh, and they did that for about six days of their practices three times a week. So in terms of what we found, the, we found from this warm-up uh, that using the wearable resistance significantly increased the 10 meter and 20 meter times over and above not using it, the control that did in it. So you just using these guys, using the wearable resistance in a warm up improved speed more so than the control. We also found that their repeated sprint ability improved quite substantially. The counter movement jump didn't improve because they weren't doing any counter movements and the standing long jump uh, improved also in the wearable resistance. These are effect sizes, and I won't explain what effect sizes, but they're a way of just, like percentages, they tell us about how they improve. But over here, you will actually see more so what, uh, where the change is. This is a percentage change. The greys are the control group, and the dark greys are the wearable resistance group. And these are the percentage change in time. So some of these, People, you know, decrease their five meter time or 10 meter time in this example here by over 6%. All these black boxes going down mean that they, these, these athletes, these are individuals, improve their sprint times or decrease their sprint times, should I say. So as you can see, some of the athletes did not respond to the wearable resistance also. So, you know, we're saying, we're not saying that the wearable resistance is going to cause adaptation in everybody. Some people didn't respond. Over here, we can see definitely that uh, the control group just didn't, many of the control groups didn't change at all. In fact, they got slower and some did get a little bit quicker. That's the smallest worthwhile change, that dotted line there. Only one person made a real worthwhile change from the warm up in the control group. And you can see the same here for the 20 meter time. Most athletes are responding really well to the wearable resistance. We get one or two that don't. However, most of the control group didn't make substantial type changes in their 20 meter time. So again, really interesting finding. Using just wearable resistance as part of what you do, as part of a warmer, can make you quicker. So just to finish off, uh, where to next? There's, we're never short of a question. This was a really interesting study out of Joy de Mean de Geech's lab uh, in Spain, where he compared the Nordic hamstring eccentric training to actually sprint training. And he, he found that sprint training uh, increased the length of the biceps femoris. Jordan's always interested in hamstring health, uh, and that's his uh, niche area. So, Yes, we know the Nordic hamstring uh, eccentric training improves, improves hamstring strength, but in this study, you also found that sprint training increased the fascicle length and at the same time improved both sprint performance and mechanics. And it was interesting in, uh, when one of the studies have just come out from uh, Wales that they found that using the shank loading actually improve biceps femoris long head length as well. So it leads me to the, the thoughts of, okay, what say we actually not only look at wearable resistance as a form of improving sprint performance, but also as a means to actually uh, increase the length of the biceps muscle, uh, biceps femoris long head and some of those other hamstring muscles. Has it got potential for that? It would be interesting to look at uh, for sure. So wearable resistance as a means to actually improve athletic injury resistance to hamstrings, injuries, is worthy of uh, investigation. Also, this just came out of the Simply Faster blog, well, not just, just last year with Pedro Alcaraz, and I found this really interesting where he was looking at vest. He, he compared vest loading to uh, some sort of electromagnetic device that resisted a person. And what he found that was that the actual vest loading made the people quicker, but it also improved their change of direction as well. And this was interesting in that he, and it makes sense again, the vest loading 
instead actually increase the mass of the of the participants and if you know mass times velocity equals momentum so they had greater momentum so when you had to when you were training with it the athletes had greater momentum they had to uh, apply greater forces to decelerate the body and then move it again so as soon as you took that uh, additional mass off you were actually you know a lot stronger and so therefore could change your direction a lot better so the questions that arises for me okay that's with vest loading can can the same be done with limb loading so as I say, there's there's lots of questions to be answered in this area, and uh, if any of you are interested, well, let us know. Uh, there's lots of there's lots to do yet. That there is uh, New Zealanders are called Kiwis, uh, and that there is a Kiwi bird, so that's where I, I thought uh, I'd end. Just a little bit more education in zoology. So, thanks for your time. I'm going to hand it over to Chris or Joe now. I'm not sure. I'll go, because since we're talking research, I can talk about what I did with Aaron, if that's all right. Hey, Chris? Yeah? Oh, I think um, I think we're going to do the, the intro now, and then we're going to finish with you. We're going to bring the okay. practical in at the end. Is that cool? Sure. Yeah, just to go off um, where JC was. You guys can hear me okay. I'll be fairly quick. We don't want to get to you as quick as possible. Setting up the presentation. Love to just. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. You guys, John, you can hear me. Yeah, I can. Okay. Well, we'll jump right into the next section. JC, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's always exciting to hear about the research, even though I've heard most of it. You know, we talk about it on a daily basis. I always pick up something new from it. Um, and I think. Uh, what will be interesting now for my section is we're going to talk a little bit about just where, where wearable resistance fits into the toolbox, um, why it was developed, how it developed, and, and its role as a resistance tool for movement and sport training in general, and, and um, getting the SNC or the coach or the trainer to understand, again, that it is a tool. It's not the only tool, but it has a, a, a real use in specific areas because we often get a lot of questions from people asking things like, uh, how does it relate to squats? Where does it fit in? Do I use it in the gym? Do I use it on the track? Is it in the field? And so understanding the, the uses and the limitations of it along with traditional training uh, is quite important. And before we, we get to that, what I like to do in this part of training as it applies to current training. Um, the importance of that history is I don't think a lot of people in our field really think or have thought a lot about why we're using certain tools or where these tools have come from. And it's really important. I think we've learned, we spent a lot of time mastering tools, but not necessarily understanding whether or not they were the right tools for the job. As an SNC coach myself, who's come up over the last 35 years, you know, we often found ourselves stuck with equipment trying to figure out how to use it with athletes. You know, we had machines, we had bars, we had dumbbells. We knew they needed resistance of some kind, but they didn't always fit the body. And, and it's important to understand you know, the different tools. And so uh, this is actually taken out of our LVRT level one course. It's an introduction into the history of resistance training. And I'll jump right in with basically starting around the 1950s. So it's funny that everything is now about movement and body weight training. And it's important to recognize that as anybody who studies history knows, things kind of work cyclically. And we're sort of back to where we started. Um, back in the 50s and even 60s, 70s, and 80s, that little picture of that gym there, you know, even when I was in school in the 70s, that, that, was, that pretty much looked like our gymnasium at school. Everything was based around gymnastics and movement. And resistance and sport and activity at this time was body weight. Things were in, in, you know, influenced by military calisthenics, uh, gymnastics. There was basic equipment that was done to make obstacles or extra force, like jumping boxes or a a horse. But the mindset was very much on being healthy, being functional, and of course having a strong citizenship. Then, 
Now, oh, one too many. Um, so in the 50s and 70s, things started to change. It was the post-war economy, strong boom, increased leisure time. Now the body beautiful mindset started to develop uh, on the west side. And in the, uh, of course, the Cold War was starting to ramp up and Olympic lifting was taking precedence in the east. But resistance in terms of exercise started to become free weight. And so we started to see free weight activity coming into mainstream for a number of reasons. But like I said, Cold War, leisure, body beautiful, Olympic lifting, but free weights were now becoming a resistance tool that people were understanding. But they weren't being developed for athletes. And I think, and I think that's an important thing to remember. Bodybuilding had a different purpose and Olympic lifting had a different purpose. Uh, it is a sport and it is an athlete, but it wasn't a footballer who created, who started using this type of free weight training for football. Uh, moving ahead. Now, in the 70s and 80s, that was the equipment boom. Arthur Jones and Gary Jones, two of the guys I know both and uh, was there when Hammerstrick was coming up. We're all familiar with the Nautilus circuit um, that, that popped up. Universal was one of the other lines. And people also have to remember, this also wasn't developed for athletes in sport and movement. It was a way to commercialize free weights. Free weights were difficult to learn. They were difficult to understand. They were heavy. Um, and so, but they were taking form. And people realized, well, I can make a form of resistance that is easy to use. We can commercially sell. And basically, we could commercialize it. And that was when, if you remember, if anybody was around that time, you used to see the Nautilus centers popping up with those 12 exercises. Circuit training came up. Um, and we were all jumping on doing isolated bodybuilding movements, muscle movements, but with selectorized equipment, which made it easy because you didn't need a lot of instruction. And if you remember at that time, those equipments all had a little placard, and it just showed you how to use it, showed you how to pick your weight, showed you the movement. And you didn't need that trainer, and you didn't have to figure out how to do an Olympic lift or something a little more technical. And I'm not saying that the equipment wasn't good, but I think it's important that we do understand that it wasn't a bunch of sport coach athletes creating this stuff to optimize transference and performance. It was basically a commercial play on resistance training. And the resistance, again, was machine loaded. Then the 90s and 2000s, a bunch of other things happened. We really started to understand a little bit more. There was a big move on the American model with the off-season. NSCA became very strong. There was interlinks now with the East. What was happening in, in the Olympic lifting from the Soviet bloc countries, it really started to become more mainstream in North America as well in Europe. Power lifting had started to become mainstream. People were understanding that. Uh, we were mixing uh, things like machine training and power training. We were starting to think about sports because sport was a boom. Everything was about getting bigger, stronger, and faster. The Olympic movement now is making a lot of money, and competitive advantage is really important. Sports technology was growing, but as far as resistance training goes, 1RM was king, and we all went that route. You know, you walked into a training facility anywhere in North America, and you'd see a wall of squat racks, a wall of platforms, a wall of leg presses. And we were all pushing 1RM, you know, and, um, and that was it. We didn't always ask if it was the right thing. We always just assumed the more you got into a 1RM, the more your improvement. But I think we started to see that doesn't always work either. And in current day, and certainly in the last sort of 10, 20 years, there's really been a return to function. Um, and that is movement is now the foundation of resistance. And people are looking at... Um, yeah, um, people are looking at how do I improve movement? And as myself, I think a lot of people around the field were re realizing that some of the tools we had were limited. It's not that they don't have a place, but they were limited. Limited in things like we mentioned in transference. How do you prepare an athlete for a very multi-dimensional activity? Body weight resistance started coming back in. Lightweight resistance started coming back in. Functional resistance, the, re the resurgence of the kettlebell which I always found fascinating because uh, anybody who does know the history know that thing's probably got hundreds of years of history. But when you paint it pink and you teach a course on it and you call it functional, it's all new again. 
um, sport was changing too. For the first time in 30, 40 years, speed and endurance were outweighing size and strength. Um, and, you know, I'd worked with several world-class programs and pro teams where you'd seen even the size of athletes was starting to change. If you think, JC, what a rugby player, what a rugby prop looked like, in uh, 20 years ago, I mean, they even a football lineman, we were looking at 300, 350 pound people, you know, 150 kilo people and size and power was king. But now people are saying, well, I'd rather have somebody that's 120 kilos or 250 pounds that can move like the wind. And so the mindset was just coming around back to movement focus. Why is it important? Well, it, as always with history, if you don't know it, you're doomed to repeat it. And the other thing is, we often jump into tools, we jump into trends without thinking, should we be doing them? I remember, and I always use this story with uh, one of the uh, Olympic athletes I was training with when I moved out to Malaysia. We were preparing for the Olympics, and I was working then with world number one. This was the men's doubles program from Malaysia Badminton. And of course, in Asia, well, I mean, badminton is a, a world sport, and certainly, if not the quickest athletes on the planet, right up there. We were in the training center in 2001, uh, 2000 preparing, no, this was 2003 preparing for 2004 Athens, and we we're trying to get a movement profile and a loading, uh, uh, fitness profile from the athletes. We did squats, we did power cleans, we we're doing bench press, we we're doing basic uh, uh, a fitness profile from the athletes. And, and one of the badminton guys who was then, he was world number one, so he was the best in the world at what he did. I think he's a two time Olympic silver medalist. And we were bench pressing, we we're doing a one arm test, and everybody agreed we needed these numbers. But uh, we got up, we started with 60 kilos, and we went up to 80 kilos, and he gets under the bar to do this 1RM80, and um, as soon as he got under the bar, he started to move it, and he, he comes back up, and he says, oh, my wrist is sore, and he just looks at me, he goes, coach, my bracket weighs 80 grams. Why do I have to bench press 80 kilos? And that question really stuck with me, and to this day, it's the best question anybody's ever asked me. And to be honest, I, and I always tell the story, I, I pretty much lied to him. I gave him the strength and conditioning story about how shoulder strength was important and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, a badminton athlete, a doubles player who's hitting a 500 kilometer an hour doubles uh, uh, jumping smash probably never needs to do an 80 kilo bench press in his entire life. Maybe doesn't even need to do a bench press. And so it was one of the things that really got me thinking about, you know, the tools we're using. And, and yes, they're getting fitter and stronger, but it does it transfer. And the one thing for sure is athletes know what works and, and what, what doesn't work. And it doesn't mean a bench press isn't a good exercise, but it was about understanding the tool. And so, you know, all of this were things that were affecting me at the time. I was training a bunch of people for the Athens Olympics at that time, and that's when the whole first uh, idea and, and prototype play for me came with Exogen is I was thinking, well, where does a person like that need resistance? Because he needs strength. Uh, and how do we apply it? You know, and again, an 80 gram racket, that's three, three ounces. So how do we train resistance for a three ounce racket and a shuttlecock that's going to be moving in the range of 400 to 500 kilometers an hour leaving the racket? It's obviously a different tool and a different thinking. And that sent me on the journey that ultimately created wearable resistance and exogen. Um, so a little bit on traditional versus uh, wearable resistance. So TRT, as we call it, can be described as resistance training that utilizes external equipment, where the user focuses on lifting, moving, or accelerating a submaximal or maximal external load with a desired outcome to overload the neuromuscular system for primarily maximal strength, hypertrophy, or power ad adaptations. And of course, general forms of traditional resistance training out there now. We've got selectorized equipment. We've got more heavy body weight training or suspending than within other apparatus. You can see this. Sled there with Usain Bolt, lightweight dumbbells, you know, and the heavy weight lifters forms of traditional re resistance training. And one thing that's really important there is to focus on the word external. I want you to just think about that for a moment. Um, and and we're, we're going to come to that, back to that here in a second. 
Um, some general characteristics of traditional resistance training. You can load heavy. Definitely stimulates high levels of hormones. An effective tool, as we all know, for building high strength on a single case. And that's a really important feature. Um, the focus is often on a maximal or heavy loading, not necessarily on optimal loading. Um, it will alter movement mechanics, as uh, not necessarily in the sport or competitive setting. Progressions are generally in large increments, and they're not always sensitive enough for sport-specific movements. Like I said, think of a hand accelerating in a smash that's creating a terminal velocity of the world record for a double smash now is 527 kilometers per hour, which is a little over 300 miles an hour. So you think about that. What, what's the sensitivity to that hand? It's not in pounds, that's for sure. Uh, it's usually too heavy to achieve sport-specific speeds. One thing we all know with resistance training, we talk about things like the desire to move fast is as important as moving fast. But real sport moves really fast. And the other thing that we found, and certainly I found, and you know, I'm open to disagreement or agreement on all these things, but transference to comp competition is often very limited. And that is when we're talking about sport specific transference from those movements. And so that brings us to the question what is transference? This is an example I like to use. Um, on the page there is literally hundreds of millions of dollars of successful products that are out there for the golf industry uh, to provide a resistance to the motion of rotation. I won't necessarily resistance, say resistance to the golf swing because there's two things missing from that picture. And I'm not sure if anybody's, um, um, if anybody's uh, looking on, uh, on the comment section, but if anybody can guess what's missing from that picture, if we're talking about sports specificity and transference, and I don't see any questions popping up there, but um, I think everybody kind of sees. There's no golf. Yeah, <laughs> Jason, thank you. Of course, you knew that already, mate. <laughs> um, there's no, nobody there is holding a golf club, and nobody there is on a golf course. So we have to ask ourselves honestly, whether you agree with me or not, how specific is it? Because golf is a highly specific sport that takes into everything from the wetness of the grass to the heat of the day, to the direction of the sun and the direction of the wind, the sweatiness of your hand on that club. And those th things are specific. So how can we say it transfers if we're not in the sport? So one of the challenges, or the challenges I faced when I was looking at developing a resistance tool that offered something different to traditional resistance tools, and remember, those tools are still great. I mean, I still squat and snatch for specific reasons. But when we got to that transference side, you know, there was, there was gaps. And, and number one, I knew we needed a resistance that was more specific. And there's nothing more specific than getting a resistance that you can use in your actual sport. Uh, challenge two, it had to be individual. We take a look at what happens. If you've ever, had the, if you've ever trained a team and you're doing a set of drills with 12 athletes, um, it's really tough to individualize them if you're using, say, kettlebells, or you're using a tubing, or you're using something where the resistance is hard to quantify on an individual level. But ultimately, if you're working in a high performance state, if it's not individual, then you're not solving the individual's issue. Challenge three, it still has to allow progression. Resistance training still needs ramping. You know, it still needs to be able to be uh, loaded. It still needs to be unloaded. Challenge four, and probably the most important, Four and five are kind of the same. It can't be disruptive. It, if it's disruptive to skill, then it's actually contradictory to the whole purpose of why you're training. And then I used to think too, well, is it possible that it's not only not disruptive to skill, but challenge five was, can it actually enhance skill and movement? And like movement itself, today's solutions have to be intuitive. You know, what are we learning now? We're getting more intuitive. We're getting more in tune with the body. We're getting more organic. And that's what I think the direction is right now. And those were the challenges we faced developing exogen and, and the next level of wearable resistance.
Um, so what is what is wearable resistance as a category? Uh, this is the definition we use in our uh, LVRT course. It's a form of resistance training that up directly to the body. It is via generally a piece of clothing or garment to which weight or loading can be applied. This is a really important point. It's used primarily during your actual sport or activity. And I can tell you right now, I mean, we're working with, as John, as you know, Chris, as you know, in, in their sport. It's not becoming an accentuated traditional tool that they're adding just in the gym for core work or box training. You know, all those are, are necessary areas to have resistance in, but they're using it in real competition and, and sports specific settings. And um, what's really important with wearable resistance is you don't need to think about transference because you're actually doing your sport. So transference is direct. And as we all I always say you don't change what you you just change what you wear, not what you do. So these were some resistance forms. One of those JC actually developed out there in AUT. You can see a form of a weighted vest. You can see a piece of sort of sort of trunk loading around the chest. Of course, the ankle weight and had to, you know. And there were ways we were trying to apply weight to the body. LVRT, you'll hear that mentioned a few times today. Just LVRT is the is the uh, signature training course in the in the training methodology we put into wearable resistance, and it just refers to light variable resistance. Keyword light. Uh, generally, a methodology focuses on using movement relevant light resistance, mostly less than 10% of body weight, that provides a specific and a relevant adaptation with the ability to vary the load for specific purposes. It's important. to know that it conforms to the laws of periodization and it emphasizes most lined core of it. If the, if the athlete is not in control, then the range of motion, not the equipment. Uh, total loading for a movement or a session is often less than one kilo or one to two pounds. And Chris, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about some of his experience in the very technical area of speed. Um, one thing that was always surprising to me when I created the kit was my first thought is I came from a traditional resistance training background. I was used to, you know, 25 or 50 kilo loaded sleds and 50 pound, 20 pound weighted vest. So when I created Exogen, I was worried, God, we don't have enough weight on this suit until we started putting it on athletes and they were like, no dude, I don't want the extra weight. You know, athletes were self-selecting half a pound. I can hear you, Joe, yeah, but your, like your internet is cutting out. Yeah, it just, it's just rebooted itself. I think it's coming back up. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, movement speeds need to be at competition speed. Other things that are key, again, no coach wants skill disrupted, and, and any good S&C coach knows that battle with the coach on weight training, resistance training, and its effect, even the feeling the day after a training session. You have to focus and maintain sports skill, not just in technical training, but in your resistance training. The hands and feet must remain free. I don't know who you are, but if you're holding anything in your hand, that wires the brain differently for movement. And first thing it does, it usually wires for protection. And a brain wire for protection is not focusing on high speed or optimal movement. These are the most sensitive areas on the body for a reason. And one thing we realized is if any part of the body has to not be involved during resistance, it's the sensitive areas of the hand and feet, especially if you're playing a sport. Um, it's used in your actual sport and actual competition environment. You are allowed to maintain focus on your skill performance. So. With wearable resistance, we're not telling people to maximize force. We're telling them to hit their baseball target accurately or make the right club face connection with the ball. They still stay focused on their sport activity, but they have a resistance that's stressing them and, and, and putting an adaptation into that movement. But focus is on skill. Loading is activity and individual specific. 
we believe and we're seeing that it's optimizing or helping certainly to improve transference because it's actually doing the sport. But one thing we see is it's also a great tool to take the benefits from traditional resistance and help bring that into the competitive setting. So remember again, it's a tool in the spectrum of training, not that it replaces training in other areas. And as it said there, it doesn't necessarily replace traditional resistance training or other adaptations that are necessary. The S&C coach, the trainer, the coaches, they still have to figure out what's the best tool for the job with that athlete at that time of year. And and the last thing is just looking at the laws of training, the big four, individualization, um, one of the things we've learned, you know, again, because it's so intuitive, we tell coaches, make sure your athlete feels it. Don't force them things like we do with traditional resistance. If the load feels wrong, reload it. You'll find the place very quickly that makes your skill and your movement accentuated or correct or proper. Uh, you don't have to suffer through, um, like I said, other forms of resistance where everything's thrown off. Uh, to the stimulus imposed. Again, we always say, and even that means if it's four ounces or eight ounces, well, um, progressive overload again over time. Uh, really excited to hear a little more from Chris on this, some of the things he's seen. But you don't just hammer people with what you want. It just changes a little bit with the type of loading and the position and the location of loading. And overtraining. Again, listen to your body. Like anything else, if you walk into a movement session one day, you're on the track and you've got a loading session with the shorts and you're going to be working on, say, short-term accelerations in the hip and you start the loading protocol for that day and you notice the athlete's struggling and they're tired, guess what? They probably might, they might need an unloaded day. You know, you still have to listen to your body. High-speed loading, uh, high-speed light loading has as much stress on the body as low-speed heavy loading. In JC's sports science session, what a light load at high speed can do. So again, it just means training smart. And that's, that's, a, that's a wrap up on sort of the introduction um, to exogen uh, as a tool, where it fits in, some of the, the values it has in the chain with traditional resistance, and some of the things to think about as we move into Chris's session, who's gonna be sharing very specifically from the practical and the coach's side, uh, on how the how the product applies and, and some of the places it works and doesn't work and uh, from a very high end practitioner specific. Well, let me tell you how I got into this. Um, I have always been a quester, a holy grail guy looking for the thing that is the magic bullet to make everyone run 10, 500 meter dash. And I was surfing on the internet, or I forgot what I was doing, but I, I heard that Hank Krajenhoff, who is a famous sprint coach, Olympic sprint coach in the Netherlands, has hit a whole bunch of world champions you know, from the Netherlands. It's kind of rare. Uh, he was doing some different things, and so I've, I've known Hank for a long time, and I called him up, and I said, hey, what have you got going on? And Hank was very cryptic in his response, which he normally is because he knows I can go crazy with stuff. And he just started sending me some pictures of this girl that he's training who would have been in the Olympics this year. We don't know what's going to happen from that. And she had on some interesting looking clothes. And I thought, well, from the picture, it looks like she's got on some new kind of gear. So I had to go into the research mode to figure out who is making some kind of gear that has green stripes on it and there's probably looks like there's some kind of weight on it. And sure enough, I eventually found Exogen. And I started reading into it and let's see, go ahead here. I mean, come on, look at that. That looks cool. It's Spider-Man. Everyone wants to train like Spider-Man and look like Spider-Man. So I'm thought, well, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So being like I am, I bought everything so I could look like Spider-Man. Uh, I got my stuff. Uh, I was a little bigger than I thought, and the stuff didn't fit really well. I guess I, I wasn't a medium anymore. I'm kind of a large or maybe even an extra large for the pants and all that. 
but eventually I got all, all I got my sizing down. I got the whole thing. And, and before I ever have my athletes start trying stuff, I try it out. And so I put everything on and I decided to go for a long walk just to see what happened. And sure enough, the next day I was sore. I'm thinking, well, that was kind of dumb. You know, I was sore in weird places from... <laughs> From putting just smacking the weights on, trying to look like the guy on the on the on the advertisement there. But I got into it, and I, and I knew there was something there, and, and there has always been something there. Uh, back in the late '90s here in the states, there was a guy that was selling uh, something called a Colca thigh trainer, where it was like a strap that went over your your thighs, and you slid weights into you know big heavy weights into these slots and you would sprint in them and you know he did his research you know he had the paper the one paper that showed three guys got faster I bought those the problem is those suckers bounced around and you were bruised by the time you were done working out in them the last thing you need is your runners all bruised in the thigh from wearing the pants that you had on uh, so it was cool um, initially about the exogen stuff is it didn't move which is a big deal uh, because I think when your body knows there is something on there that flops around it changes what it does because it perceives that as a threat rather as something that's more intrinsic or something that is tied to your body that's not going to bounce back, that might not flop up and hit you in the face. Uh, so I knew there was really something to it. So as I started messing around with stuff, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just throwing weights on people and seeing what happens because that's actually the best way to learn how you do this stuff is you just try and sometimes people come back sore, come back sore in funny ways, uh, but that's how you learn. Um, hang on, I missed a slide here. So here's what I learned. I'm going to do this first, and this is not normally me. Normally I'm never into when not to use person. I'll find a way to use it no matter what. So. If you have someone who has bad running form, sometimes they don't work so well. So what you see here, the picture on the right or on the side of the screen is you have someone who's got a pretty severe crossover when they're sprinting from the front. And I call it that because their heel of the right leg is on underneath the left armpit. And that's what he looks like every time he takes a stride. So if I were to weight him down, I would exasperate that problem. Uh, I would actually make his gait worse. Uh, also, I found that when you're limb, when you're shank loading, by the way, I learned to use the word shank after I started working with JC. I had to look up what a shank was initially, and he kept talking shank, and with his accent, it made it even worse. Um, if you have poor foot function, uh, that foot goes crazy places. Um, and someone put up there, are we supposed to be seeing something on a slide? I don't have any video because I wasn't sure how the video was going to work, so I tried to make it all slides. You're just going to have to work with me here. Um, so when you've got someone with really bad form, uh, you need to be really careful. And I'm going to show you when you have someone that has bad form, what you can do with it and make that improve that form. But if you just take someone who's not that good and you slap it on, like you see in the pictures, it's not going to end well. You're going to get some hip flexor problems. You're going to get some weird feet stuff. And I learned, you know, some everyone forgets that everyone's kind of my uh, my guinea pig. But you learn. So I'll get that out of the way because let's get to the fun stuff. Uh, we'll start with trunk loading and work our way down. Uh, I had the vests. I wanted to use the vests. There's some positive, some negative research about loading the trunk. Uh, Aaron Fesser, who I've worked with, has done some research on that through JC. Um, and I have a group of runners. I have distance runners and sprinters. I have all kinds of athletes that come through here. And my distance group, uh, the dad who liked to come, who is also an excellent track coach, his name is Mike Kennedy. Uh, he is a physics teacher. I, he has a PhD in physics. And we started talking about uh, adding weight in my basement, which is my gym. I have chalkboard paint everywhere, and 
my chalk, my walls became physics problems and physics equations and thinking about how we're going to load in different ways and put weight in different places and looking at all the different joints. Uh, but he had one son who had a really bad hitch, meaning when he took a stride, his whole body jerked back into the right. And so we're thinking, well, if we're going to load that on there, what we might want to do is weight the side that is pulling back and hard to the right because maybe from a neurologic sense his body will realize that with the added weight that going back and having the gait that he currently has is going to go back and he could get hurt. At least it won't be efficient and the body will find a new way. So what we started doing was we started weighting down the right side of his body with we probably put about 400, 500 grams on there. And sure enough, when he goes to run, he got rid of the hitch. And the body instantly, probably by the third stride, figured out that, hey, I've got this added weight for some reason and it's not flopping around. I've got to fix that. I've got to prevent that over rotation. And we straighten him out. Now, did it stick? Well, actually it did because what we did is we kept coming back to, to putting it on that side and gradually over time we decreased the load to the point where it wasn't, it, it didn't happen anymore. How did we know that to put 400 grams on there? I grabbed two things and slapped them on. It's, and then one time we went too heavy and I was like, oh, that doesn't look right, take one of those off. So there's no real rhyme or reason to it. You just have to watch your athlete and kind of have a basic idea of how the body works and take some basic ideas of the body's trying to protect itself and be as efficient as possible and see what happens. And that's kind of what's fun about these is there's a lot of experimentation that goes along with it that you can make some pretty fast changes if you hit the right spot. But that's basically all training. If you hit a workout right, you're going to make an immediate change. And so it just became another way that I could possibly improve the efficiency of a distance runner or of a sprinter. Um, Joseph kind of went over this stuff here. Uh, what I liked about it was uh, it provides an, a nonverbal cue to enforce the foot from above principle, meaning I didn't have to, by putting the weight in different places, I didn't have to yell at a kid to do something. That by putting the weight in a certain place, it became the cue. When you yell at someone or you tell them to have some kind of technique change or something like that, it's not going to work. The body doesn't understand that. You have to make the body care about what's going on, and by using the weight in different places, I could get them to look the way I want them to look. And then people say, well, what does that look like? Well, more efficient than they looked before, faster than they looked before. And we did some crazy things uh, with the limb loading, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, and it, kind of another idea that I thought was if I put the weight on the shank, when they hit the ground, I can, in, in different situations, and slap that foot down onto the ground, with that added weight, it's going to kind of create more of an eccentric or a co-contraction to make the ankle stiffer, which is something that I played with a lot and still continue to play with and use today. In fact, I did use them today. I just, before I came to this, I trained some people. Nobody's supposed to say that. We're supposed to be locked down. Um, so stuff that I liked, really basic stuff. We did sprints. And again, this is before I talked to JC. This is me move, screwing around before I actually got a clue and got some direction. Um, we sprint with them, of course. We do longer sprints. Uh, my longest sprint that we train is 23 seconds. And by putting the weights on their shanks, uh, it fatigued them a lot more than what it normally would. So the idea was I didn't have to train. I didn't have to do as much volume running. If I could put those on and I could create more of a environment from a chemical standpoint that required more energy rather than just repeat after repeat after repeat. Uh, I really love them for stiff-legged runs and I'm going to show you talk about a bunch of variations that I do with those when I start talking about how I misload these and then my new favorite is a lock knee run which is basically a stiff leg run with a slight bend in your knee. Uh, you get much better ankle motion 
uh, than you would with a stiff-legged run. There are two different things you're looking for. You're coaching both of those for different reasons, even though they're very similar. Uh, those are the basic ones. So here's where it starts to get crazy. Um, we're going to start to put the weights in different places and add a twist when we, when we run. Uh, I'm into spinal co-contractions. I'm into how well the spine functions when you sprint. And when we over-rotate purposely um, you know, with a twist, or you're going to twist into a knee that's coming up, uh, you're going to create that spine to want to co-contract better so it will find a better place, a more powerful place. So with the vests, we will put weights on the shoulders and we'll rotate into one leg. So if I am working my left leg, I'm going to put the weight on my right shoulder and I'm going to do about a quarter turn every time that knee comes up when I go over. I do them over many hurdles or wickets. Um, which is a great exercise because part of being an athlete is learning how to take your torso off your hips when you sprint. Uh, the common team sport coach would complain, well, sprinting really doesn't do anything. Uh, we're moving around all the time, and they'll call it track speed compared to game speed. Well, let's work on game speed then. Uh, you're going to have to learn how to take your shoulders off your hips and run not perfectly in track fashion. You know, you're, you're kind of crooked in one way. And one way that's going to work better is if you work on your spinal co-contractions. Um, what else we do is uh, we're going to make our upper body unstable with water bags and halos. I like water bags. We hold them over our heads or you can take a weight and move them around. And uh, by doing that, and I put weight on your leg, it's going to make that leg come through much more, which means it's going to require more energy to move that leg through. So that was me playing around before I got an actual clue. Um, I got in contact with JC. Uh, we started talking through Skype and WhatsApp and all these other things. I learned to make a cheap phone call internationally. And we came up with an idea to do some research uh, with Aaron Fesser, who is, is phenomenal and still is phenomenal to work with. Um, and we decided that we were going to see what we could put together. Uh, we were going to bring a whole bunch of sleeves to a bunch of high school kids. Uh, they were my football team and see what happens if we went through the training with it. And so we went through it. She showed up. We weighed the kids. We did a pretest uh, in January. It was cold, uh, as it is in January every year here. And we went through the seven-week uh, protocol. Uh, and what's hard as a coach is once you set the protocol, you can't make changes, uh, which is hard to do as you know an actual high school coach where you, know, you want to see your kids get better, and you say, hey, you change this technique or just change your workout. Um, so we went through the tests. We, we post-tested. Uh, we had a couple bumps in the testing. Uh, that was the polar vortex year, where it was 50 below zero for a string of days here. That's 45 below in Celsius. I looked that up for all the people who don't understand Fahrenheit, because I know JC always gets, I, JC and I get Fahrenheit and Celsius mixed up all the time. So we missed some days. We came da back, did some post-testing. Uh, it went OK. Um, some kids got better, some didn't. Uh, and when we started to look at the actual data, we realized that the kids that didn't get better gained between 5 to 10 pounds in body weight over that six-week period of time, which isn't always great for sprinting. Uh, remember, there are football players, and a high school football player, no matter what you tell them, thinks, well, i got to get bigger, coach, and I ate a lot. Uh, but we did have some good results with some of the kids that didn't gain that much weight. Um, and we were looking more at acceleration at this point, uh, but where we saw a really big improvement was peak velocity, which is something that I, I always thought was going to be true with this. I wasn't too sure about the, the acceleration. Uh, the mechanics didn't make sense to me. Uh, but like I said, some got better, some didn't. Uh, but peak velocity, everyone got better. So end of that is she left, she got her research, and now I got to play.
So I had lots of sleeves, I had lots of equipment, and I started breaking out uh, my creativity box. So what I started doing was looking at JC's research where if you put the wearables on, it may impact your stride frequency or your stride length and different things. So I decided I'd take my 1080 sprint and I'm going to put sleeves on and I'm going to pull you faster. Now, if you understand the physics behind it, your legs have to move faster or you will fall. Your body knows that and you put the 200, 300, 400, 500 grams on there, you have got to turn those legs over in a faster fashion with a greater, with your limbs weighing more. So we were improving rotational inertia. So then what I decided to do is we got pretty good at that and I didn't want to weigh them down too much, mostly because we were running out of space on the sleeves to put the weights. So then working with Mike Kennedy, again working with his son to balance him out, we started putting wearables just on one side. So we would wear one calf sleeve. And then I would pull you, or we'd do mini hurdles. And I'm going to show you the pictures here of, of what that's going to look like. And basically, if you look at the rotational inertia for the whole system, if that one leg is weighted down, the rest of the body has to compensate for that, and you're going to get a bigger stride length on one side. Then we said, all right, if we put a sleeve on one side and an uh, arm sleeve on the opposite side, what happens? Well, we found out nothing happens because they balance themselves out. So what we started doing was putting a sleeve on one side and an arm sleeve on the same side. And again, we had these kids coming back saying, man, I could really feel my spine work. I could really feel everything start to work. I, you know, and it became a really great training stimulus that their body had to learn to move better in this new environment. And that's really what we want to do is not only are we improving rotational inertia and the angular velocities of everything that's going on, but it's also I use it as a stimulus to the body that they have to learn how to adapt uh, to try and make themselves you know, compete, you know, compete, or in this case, run at an overspeed. And I do love doing it with overspeed. Um, I do it a lot. Uh -oh. So this kid has got one leg weighted, one leg not weighted. You can see the difference in the knee coming up on the unweighted side. Uh, we have done things because I have a lot of timers. And if you weight one side, sometimes kids run slower. But if you can figure out what leg is coming up and what leg is what their asymmetry is, you can make people run faster with 200 grams. And I will admit, since there is no track season anymore, once I figure that out, we would put a sleeve on underneath one side and put 200 grams on so the kid ran faster. That's not cheating, really, is it? I don't know. It works if you can figure that out and you can figure out people's asymmetries. Um, and again, you can see I have many hurdles set up, and I like the many hurdles set up because it gives you a target for frequency. Uh, and again, that's something that I want to look that I want to deal with. You know, if I want to. Uh, make your stride length longer and it weights you down in a different place, I can do that. Uh, but basically, I find that two meters is a pretty good distance if you are wearing the wearables, um, especially if you're getting towed or you're using one leg. Does anyone have any questions so far? I know I just zoomed through a whole bunch of stuff. All right, here's the other place where it works really well. Now, the oscillatory isometrics. Oscillatory isometrics is something that you do in the weight room. And like Joseph referred to earlier, and I actually had slides, but I would just be repeating what JC and Joseph already said. Uh, what we're trying to do is merge what you do in the weight room and what comes out on the track. We've all seen the kid that can squat the world, but he can't run to save his life. He can't vertical jump. So oscillatory isometrics is a concept uh, that you're going to squeeze and relax a muscle. For example, you can look them up on YouTube. Um, I have some pictures coming up here. 
but the idea is that you are letting the muscle relax and you're letting the tendon pick up the slack and the slack is the, the tendon is actually going to pull you back and then the muscle is going to grab again and make you go which is actually what happens when you when you sprint and actually any any athletic movement uh, Russian research showed that the best athletes had the greatest ability to relax and contract and that's really what we're trying to do here and if you look at the first one that I skipped, uh, you're going to merge inter and intramuscular, intramuscular contractions. Intramuscular is, I'm going to press on a weight, intramuscular is how is my whole system working. Uh, so a very basic one is uh, a split squat, where you're going to go down into a split squat, you're going to squeeze your muscles as hard as you can, and then relax, you're going to fall, you'll feel a bounce at the bottom, and then your, your muscles will pick you up again. My friend Cal Dietz, a Vexel athlete, he's the hockey coach at University of Minnesota. He wrote triphasic training and all the other, the millions of triphasic things that are out there. In my opinion, the best book that's out there on strength training. Started messing with oscillatory isometrics. Now in the picture, what's going to happen in the video, you will see that when he kicks, uh, he's going to kick into that band as hard as he can. And what he has on the end of his on his ankles, as does this gentleman, as you see that they have weights. Now, Cal has more tools in his weight room to measure muscle activity than anyone around. And so what he found is doing these oscillatory isometrics creates the greatest EMG readings out of any exercise. And again, it's going at velocity. They're going to kick into the band. Uh, you can kick through the band and put your feet in between. Uh, you can go onto YouTube and he has got 143 different oscillatory isometric exercises. And when we decided to put some weights on the end, and this person has two pound weights, Cal has uh, the exogen for his son and doesn't share them into his weight room. Um, the increase in the EMG was as much as 20 to 30 percent when you put the wearables on. So what do I do? Well, we do. I, I put the wearables on the shanks or on the arms, and we go through and we kick the bands, and we move as fast as we can. Uh, the ankle weights aren't great because they move. Uh, the exogen stay on, and that's, that's kind of a big thing. You don't want weights flying around the weight room. It's never a good thing. Some people get in trouble for that. So that's the other way that we use the the wearables, um, we do them with the isometric isometrics, or the oscillatory isometrics. And it could be if you are a volleyball player, we'll put the rubber band up high and we'll smack into it with the weight on the end. If you're a tennis player, the same thing. Uh, golf swing, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand golf. But for real sports, uh, it works pretty well. I know I'm going to get killed for saying that. And that's how we use them. Um, again, we did have a progression with Aaron, and it seemed to work pretty well. And by the way, our workouts were, we started with warm-ups. We did running drills with them on, and then we did sprints. We did prime time runs. Uh, and we did progress them down two weeks high, two weeks middle, two weeks low. Uh, if it were me, I would vary it a lot more. But because it's research and it has to be formulaic and things that people understand, um, we had to do it that way. Uh, people ask, well, do you still use them? Yeah, I still use them. I use them every workout. They're out. Um, I had to learn how to color code between the mediums and larges, so I use a safety pin, gold and silver. Um, and you have to learn how to wash them because they stink after a while. I thought I did a good job, and I sent them back to Erin, and she said, these smell horrible, and she did something else to make them smell better. I got a question here. You mentioned your training athletes, stride length or cadence. Um, so the question is, if you put them on different places, can you improve the stride length and uh, frequency, and you can actually change where foot placement goes? Um, but you have to mess with it. There's no, I have not found a universal in that. Uh, 
Uh, what's interesting is if you slap those on in different places, different people respond differently in different places. So once my athletes get used to them, they will know, they will be able to tell you, hey, I really like it in back. I really like it on the side. Um, look how I wrap it this way. I, I can really feel it in my hamstrings when we do it this way. Uh, it's such a Sprinting is such a complex movement that when you put something like that on there, the body, everyone's going to respond differently. But I will tell you this, there are placements, people have placements where they'll come back and say, yeah, I didn't like it in that spot, i got to move it. Say, yeah, that's fine, let's move it to where it's working for you. Again, because you are putting uh, a weight on something that is swinging around at a high velocity, you do have to watch and see what's going on. And as a coach, you can say, hey, move that over a little bit or flip it upside down or put it on the inside and let's see what happens. Uh, you never want to say it doesn't look good. Let's ju just go with, let's see what happens if we do this. Did that work better? Awesome. Good. Let's stay with it. And you can even look at your timers and say, hey, this looked pretty good. Let's stay with it. Because ultimately we want to run faster and we want, to, want them to feel like they're running faster. Anyone else have any questions? Chris, with your that was just in response to in response to Raj's question, yeah? Yeah. Uh, in general, how much weight do you attach to shanks, calves, and arms? Question there. Nelson. Uh I know Nelson. Um with Shanks we did and this is all there was a math formula that went into this, uh, but with Shanks, we did 500. If you weighed more than 160 pounds, we put 500 grams on. If you weighed less than 160 pounds, which was none of my kids, uh, we put 400 grams on. With the arms, uh, we do 300 to 400 grams. And it depends because arms flop around quite a bit. It depends on if you have the ones that are on your upper arm or further down. Uh, if we're sprinting, I'm not going to put 400 grams down by your wrist. Uh, that's just too much. Um, but with my son, who's a volleyball player, I'm going to put 400 grams down there. Just because I want him to learn how to whip his arm. And it's not so much a strengthening thing. I want him to learn to use his arm as a whip to hit the ball, which makes when he rotates, he has to lock into his spine better. And then the weights actually help him learn how to whip the arm. So it's maybe not so much a strengthening thing, but a learning tool. And again, I can vary the weight, I can vary the position because I just I want to create as many different environments as possible. If I can make every rep different, you're going to make a better athlete. Uh, where is the best placement for glutes and hip extension training? I'm sorry, what's that? No, I was just yeah, checking with yeah. JC because I think, I think Chris, uh, we can go ahead now and just. Uh, you, are you still opening up slides, or are we kind of now just? I'm done. To a I'm at the end. Question and answer, and a bit of our. Okay. Yeah, we'll continue continue on mm -hmm. answering. I think it's good, and just just make sure JC's on. Uh, we can all, uh, if we want to add anything in now, just come to uh, our collective uh, discussion. But go ahead there because there's a couple other questions that have come in. Well, for hip extension training, I'm going to put them on my shank and do prime time runs uh, just because it's a longer lever. Um, someone, Stefan, who does the, the bowlers for cricket, yep. did you guys see his stuff that he just came out with? Every day, <laughs> I think. Uh, Stefan and I are in, on call probably every uh, every. A couple of days. Yeah, yeah. he had doing he had really good stuff. he had really good uh, with the shank loading. He had really good hamstring development, and I agree with that. Um, glutes, I don't know. I I haven't gotten a a good reading on glutes. Um, well, I can tell you a bit of what we do with glutes. There's a few things. Uh, uh, with, and again, it's sort of what you mentioned, Chris, too, is you can actually load the glute. There's sort of three areas. When we take a look at distance runners, not so much with sprinters, but we've done it with sprinters, too, is just engagement in that upper glute. 
loading directly on the glute provides that proprioceptive feedback where when a coach knows something's not happening in that area, the athlete will come back after, you know, something like a 200 gram load loaded across the top of the glutes like that. That's eight ounces. Um, and put those right on those glutes at the upper hip, right in here. And they have a series of runs or drills and they'll come back and they say, wow, now I can really feel that area engaging. And the coach says, good, because I can see how it's affecting your posture. So a lot of the glute loading we do is about creating awareness in the glute. And it's loading from the top of the glute right down to the glute ham tie-in, both for speed or just general movement. But like what you said, it then comes back to the quality that the coach sees. Because a lot of this is responsive, right? It's not, it's not gym training where you know you got your rep and then everybody's satisfied with the result. It's put the weight there, look at the quality of the movement, and then, and like you said, make every rep a high-quality rep. Make every drill a high-quality drill and adjust and tweak it that way. So one thing we see in the glutes is there's a lot of proprioceptive looting across the glute, you know, upper, mid, lower, directly on there to stimulate some type of effect that is usually seen in some form of posture. Nelson, if I can just add to your question, in general, how much weight do you attach to the shank, calves, arms, etc.? Generally, we prescribe as a percentage of body mass, but also just remember, it's not how much. The, the thing that's more influential is the placement. If you can remember when I gave a little bit about the science, mass stays the mass, but it's at the, where you place it gets squared. So the same load just slipped further away from the axis of rotation uh, can have a, a large effect. So you've just got to keep an eye on both those things. The actual, the, the magnitude of the mass is also the, the placement. And then the third thing that we really focus on is the velocity of the movement. What you do with a, a load at 70% has very, very different outcomes that you do at 80, 90 and 100. And, that's what Chris alluded to before. Uh, sometimes we don't, because the acceleration phase is a le little less high velocity movement and the mechanics are a little bit different, sometimes we don't see the, the changes in the acceleration phase. But as soon as you get up and you get going and you get these light lo loads moving fast, they become uh, a force to be reckoned with. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. Heavier isn't, like JC said, heavier isn't always better. You can tell when it's too much weight. It, it, the limb looks like it's flopping. Uh, and then you know you've got too much on there. You'll, you'll see a change. You'll see that it's too much. It won't look right. And, and the athlete will feel that too. Yes. They'll feel like their limb is, is then, getting thrown out. Right. And, we've, and then we've gone backwards. Now it's disruptive, like, you know, other forms that we've been using previously, which isn't the goal. You know, it's keeping it close to that specific movement. And, you know, it, like you said, Chris, it's very common, especially in athletics. Not all programs are the same as, as the program you're talking about. And I get the opportunity to engage and consult with most of the sports around the world on this. But it, as you know, it's very common to see a coach holding a couple of weights in their hand during a session. And the athlete will do something and then there'll be a tweak and then it'll try that. You know, it's a very intuitive, interactive tool. Correct, Chris? Is, is that something you find? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, they know. It, and, and what's great is it, it gives them an idea. They get a better sense of what's going on with their body. They're more in tune with their body. And I think developmental athletes, they, they don't have a sense of what goes on with their body. They've been sitting in a chair staring at a screen their whole life. Uh, but your really elite athletes, they know what's going on and they can feel it. Um, and, that, and, that's, and that's a great conversation you can have with your athlete, that now they want to see, hey, let's, hey, coach, let's try this and let's put this here. Yeah, go for it, man. Let's see what, let's see what happens. There's a heap of questions in here, guys. I don't know whether we start with Michael Rump. Hi, Michael. How are you? Good to see you online. Oh, oh. Uh, love the posture effect as it might translate to health. Yeah, JC, How long do these you want to, um, can I jump in there on Michael's question? 
Yeah, yeah, I was going to actually say one of you two because I know you've actually seen this. Can I? Uh... Yeah. So very, very. Uh, Mike's question is great, and this is something Chris, you've probably been exposed to as well. Uh, for sure, you have. Is there's an immediate impact of of loading the body, and you see it in a drill. So you can put a single load into a movement. They do the drill. They unload that, and all of a sudden, like you said, the, the intrinsic cue has had its effect and they're repeating the motion you wanted. But that, Michael's question is, when does a, uh, uh, an adaptation become permanent? And that is, if you walk in and start a session and you don't apply the load, and you're just looking for the quality of movement change, from our experience, it's about a four week block. Three to four weeks, training with it fairly regularly, uh, you'll see a permanent change. But you'll see an immediate change in a drill, but the next day that'll be gone. By the end of the session, it'll be gone. So like any adaptation, we generally recommend if when you're focusing on a skill improvement, give yourself a four week block to see it. Again, you come in for a session, no loading, to see if the athletes remembered or the change in quality is there, about a four week block. And, and we're seeing that across almost all sports from baseball, rugby, athletics, swimming. It's pretty standard. But Chris, maybe you can share what you've seen on the track with your athletes. Some of the stuff happens quicker than that. Uh, when you get it right, like I said, and it, it, I'm not saying, you know, you're going to instantly develop that power, but to change in posture, I've seen it happen pretty quick sometimes, especially with this distance runner who we hit it three times, uh, came back, uh, we lessened the weight, and by the third time he was a completely different kid. But, you know, your body, when you hit it right, your body's going to make a change. I mean, a drastic impact is you I slam your toe into something, you're going to make an instant change in your gait, right? That's just a, an extreme example of that. You can make a, a minor change and still have a pretty drastic impact in the body to say, yeah, this is good, let's stay with this. This doesn't hurt anymore. This is good. Mike, uh, Chris, there's a question from Faiz on how many times a week do you use with uh, with your with your athletes? Uh, we loaded two to three days a week. Um, you know, I I'm horrible at this, and Aaron Aaron could vouch for this that I, I'm really bad about following plans. Um, I'll bring a box in, and some kids will put them on, and some kids won't. And some kids say, yeah, I want to do this today, Coach. I'm, I'm feeling it. And I said, all right, load it up. Um, but generally, if I had to plan it, we, we did two to three days a week, and we, we varied that. Um, I think we went two days, two days, three days, two days, one day, you know, just to find some kind of loading pattern. Um, I'm horrible at, at planning. I'm, I'm more of a, a county fair guy. Here's all this stuff. What do you want to do today? Uh, and how do you think you want to do it? All right, I saw you do this. I'm going to make this change. See how that goes. Right. Um, another question there, Steve. Steve. About uh, For you, uh, Corey Lamb. The next research plan. What do we, uh, we've, we've got some in the pipe all over the world. Yeah, well, we did. <laughs> we had a whole bunch of stuff in the spring that got he's, Now, he's talking correct. specifically as a track coach. Yeah, that team. was coming. What are the next research plans as a track coach? I would love to see track athletes spiked up testing on flying 10s or 20s, alternating. Yeah, like I'm not sure that we. What? Well, could you find out track it, mate? Yeah, we. Yeah. JC, we, that was what Aaron and I were going to do this spring. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I guess we were at the moment with about the, the research plans is. It's a bit. <laughs> it's a bit all over the place uh, in one regards because we get a lot of people coming in and wanting to. Uh, do things in their respective sports. So we've got a lot of stuff from Nordic skiing to kicking in AFL. Okay, so we sort of go where the people go. In terms of the sprint research, Chris is sort of uh, a pioneer in that area. We've got pockets of sprint research happening. We tend to make it more team-oriented. 
uh, and where we're sort of focused at the moment, most, a lot of our research is just uh, trying to put it in to small-sided games, into technical, tactical work, uh, into warm-ups, uh, that sort of stuff, uh, you know, just training as part of what you do. In terms of your question, Richard, we're starting to get into, and I saw another one there, uh, a tennis question. We've just been talking with Chris McLeod from the uh, UK Lawn Tennis Association. So in answer to that, we're having a look at serving speed, uh, use of wearable resistance for serve speed, and also court speed. So we're doing a little bit of work in that change of direction area. Richard, more in the, uh, we also got a student looking at the uh, pro agility test and uh, movement speed for football players in terms of, you know, getting better change of direction scores for uh, the combine. So there's little bits and pieces happening all around the world and it's pretty tough to keep, a, keep an eye on at times. But uh, well, uh, as I say, there's, in terms of the technology, uh, I feel like after six years just researching with it, it it's something that just keeps on giving it. And, and Chris is just phenomenal in this regard, like just catching up with him and see how he's using it and seeing some of the applications. Uh, yeah, like a, we'll be going hard for another six six years, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, anybody that just uses it usually comes up with some different applications, some, some you know, light bulb moments that go, wow, that's pretty cool. So, no, I didn't answer it directly. Uh, I think it was, what was it? Was it Nicholas the spiked up one, was it? No, Corey. Corey, answer that question yourself. Contact me. <laughs> well, we're um, we're coming to the end of the time. I'm just taking a look here. There's a lot of little questions. I think uh, something to suggest about the specific stuff in sprinting. You know, there's. There's a lot of good guidelines we do have on the website. Uh, some of them are, are videos that Chris and other people that we work with have been doing. So I do think it's worthwhile, you know, definitely uh, checking out the videos that are in the website. The other thing to remember, we have a full library of the research that JC and the team at AUT, Aaron, and, you know, I think there's almost 20 or more PhD studies around the world right now. That library is available also on the website. So it's uh, definitely jump in there for a look. And, um, you know, this is only an introduction. Uh, we're happy to engage with people one-to-one -one afterwards and share more of this information. Um, Chris, what I mentioned in the chat group while you were talking is, unfortunately, because of the nature of the format we use, a lot of Chris's videos, as everybody saw, had to be taken out of the presentation. And, and I apologize for that on our behalf. But what we'll do is, We'll get those videos from Chris, and we'll we'll get it to be put into the presentation format. Just give us sort of 24 hours to figure out how to do that, and I think that'll help. Just put a visual on a lot of the things that you Chris had talked about, because people were asking for the video, the video. Um, uh, just looking now to wrap up. Uh, um, uh, JC, Chris, thank you both for for joining on. Uh, I think it was very, it's always interesting to learn. Chris, you and I haven't had a chat for a little while, so it was great to hear some of the areas that you're working. And um, Thanks. I only have one question. I don't think you're bored in COVID with all those guitars behind you. Now they're all getting played. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so anything else to add? Any last thoughts? Just for people, well, this way, there are people now, there are people now uh, wondering a little bit about where to put it in. Uh, Chris, maybe a little thought on you for, for speed coaches, track coaches, S&C coaches. What's a nice place to start? You know, one thing we're, as we did with you, people don't need to buy full suits. You know, you, that's an overwhelming thing. I mean, a pair of calves, a pair, a pair of shorts, some basic things to recommend to get started. Because like you said, there's a lot of this intuitive play. Somebody was asking, you know, how many weeks at the start? But like you and I know, you've got to give yourself some play time. It really is. A, a different format. What do you recommend for somebody who's thinking about starting out? I would start with running drills. Uh, I love mini hurdles or wickets and that's really where uh, you can really use them. 
uh, because you're not going full speed. We like to think they are, but they're going 80, 90, 95%. You know, you lose that top end for fear of hitting the hurdle, uh, but that's a great place to start. And then transition into maybe some stiff-legged runs, and then go ahead and let them sprint with them on. But and how about ages? Where what 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 level athletes? I mean, you know, we I work with people from 11 to the current Olympic champion. What? Um, but from your experience, is there a specific category you like when it's maybe technical versus more near muscular? What have you found across that? Because we get asked that a lot. Oh, I just I'm not bashful for with using them. So we all all my people use them. Um, yeah. And you know, and and I play with them a lot. So you have to get past the fear that someone might get hurt or something's going to happen. You're not going to know unless you try. You're not going to get hurt. You can certainly make people better. You just have mm -hmm. to kind of watch and learn. It's an art, you know. It, training is an art. It, it's it's not paint by numbers. I I wish it was, but. I've been doing this for over 30 years, and there's an art to it. You've got to learn how to watch and look and, and figure out what your tool is, in this case, wearables, and, and where to put them. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned, like, the art. There's a question there from a guy named Ross uh, talking about gait adjustment. He said, will you load on the lateral side? That needs to be adjusted on the contralateral side. And, and, you know, again, these are some of the guidelines we've learned. In general, you can load one side, but if you're trying to balance movement, we go with about a two to one ratio. So if a person has a specific imbalance, if you overload one side too much, it actually throws the system off too much. And most movements require a little bit of balance on the other side. So like if you're correcting a tennis stroke and you load just the one arm, what we found is you need about 30 to 50% of load on the other arm or else the system is out of, the skill is actually too off. But but again, that's really individual specific. You know, I think that comes back to getting it and having a little bit of a play in a safe manner, not doing what Chris did, putting the whole suit on and loading your whole body up and going out there. You know, it was kind of starting. fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like you said, and even, and you know, it's funny, Chris, your guideline at that 150, 160 pounds, that's our LVRT guideline that I've developed, you know, and, and learned in the last, we sort of set that 70 kilo, 150 pound range. You've got that 100 to 200 gram below that for limb loading, and then it's sort of two to 300 grams above that. And it's and it's interesting that you that that's something that you found as well. But the key is it's light to start. Yeah. If it looks slow, it's too much. Yeah, 100 percent. Like you don't want to turn it into another heavy gym session. You know, it's there's a reason for that in those situations, but this is not that. Well, JC, how about yourself? Any last thoughts just on some of what the things you're excited about moving forward? We've got a lot going on um, and, and, and areas that you think are the injury area, the return to play area. Do you want to make a little comment? Because that is something we get asked about. You know, we were on last night with Miami Dolphins and the Vikings, and they're all asking the same question. What about injury? And, you know, one thing we've learned is wearable resistance is an injury solution, not an injury problem. But you still have to be smart. JC, your thoughts? One of the, uh, the the major benefits, I think, of the wearables in, in, that, in that space, and there's so many spaces, but is in that concept of injury resistance, making the tissues more resistant to injury. And we touched a little bit on, like, Jordan Mendigicha's study in terms of hamstring health. Okay, so... Again, doing some of these exercises loaded and then making the, you know, the hamstrings stronger at longer lengths it has some real benefit. And I think uh, the wearables has a real place to play there. Just what I've seen of Jordan's uh, study unloaded and then a little bit of Oliver Hurst's study. So that in that, that place, I think it's great. Injury resistance. The other place is the wearable pro provides a lot of movement variability. We can internally load, externally load, anterior load, posterior load. And that can be over four different training sessions for the same movement. And as a result, those four different training sessions, the synergists, the, the fixators, the, 
the antagonists, the agonists will all be working differently. And so we're tucking into these little different muscle groups uh, via just subtle changes in movement, which I think will have a great benefit for tissues and movement patterns as well. So there's a couple of areas to finish off with. Movement variability, injury resistance, fantastic area to get, get amongst. Okay, well, there's uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, you guys. We've had a, well, there was a lucky draw on today, and I have the announced the winner of our lucky draw for a pair of cap sleeves that are worth uh, 139 bucks US. So it's all com complete uh, with your load, you roll up the whole kit. And the lucky draw winner is Raj Ahmed. Raj. Uh, I think I saw you in the comments there. Question for Chris. Raj, you're the lucky draw winner. And we will, uh, we've got your address. We'll contact you after this. So congratulations. Hopefully you'll have some fun with the exogen. Just put that into the... Um, uh, um, into the chat there. Uh, um, so we'll wrap up now. Chris, thank you so much. I know it's your evening now, Thursday. Evening? Yeah, it's 11.15 here. What time are you there? 11.15. About 12 o'clock? Getting close. 11 15. And a big thunderstorm going down here, too. Getting a little... Um, okay. Um, yeah, my hometown is six hours north of you, so I, uh, I know exactly what uh, that area is. Um, JC, as always, it's a pleasure having both of you. We're honored that you took the time to join us. And um, for anybody who uh, is listening, to, uh, the presentation will be available on the platform to view after this. Um, I think both Chris and JC, uh, you can, if you want to reach out to any of these guys at a higher level, connect through me and I can make the right connection um, after this. Uh, my, my email is in the stream there, there. and as, as you know, I'm, I'm the CEO and uh, spent 32 years or 34 years now as a high-performance coach, so I'm happy to help answer some of the questions as follow-up. We're going to close down now, and um, remember to check out the, side, the website, movementrevolution.com. Much of the information we've talked about here is available there as well. Um, we'll be following on in another three weeks with the next webinar either in the area of endurance running or combat, so we'll let you know about that. But again, I'd just like to say thank you both to Chris and John for uh, the time, the effort, the continual engagement and support. It's awesome working with you and hearing you both. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye, JC. And thanks, everybody. Tune in. And, uh, yeah, you See you, Chris. And, of course, the team from uh, GSE and Anibal, Simply Faster, thank you very much for the support. And for all you viewers and listeners out there, thank you guys for coming along and asking your questions. And please engage with us. Check out the website. And uh, if you do decide to start with action, start simple. If it's about running, start with calves. Get that play time. We'll talk to you all soon.